Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. My name is Ruben. I am your host, your moderator for this session. And it's my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you on this bright Sunday morning for a very important webinar on the topic, Growth Factors, Evolution of Application in Implant Dentistry. A warm welcome to everyone who's joined us from various parts of the world, from India, from Middle East, from Northern Africa, from Europe, etc. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. Very quickly, I would like to know your full names and the city where you reside. You can comment the same in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and a privilege to welcome our dear speaker for today, Dr. Ahmed Osman. Dr. Ahmed received his dental degree from the Alexandria University in Egypt in the year 1995, followed by a specialization in oral surgery in the year 2002. He is the co-founder of the Alexandria Oral Implantology Association from the year 1996 and a member of the German Implant Association since the year 2005. He became a fellow and a diplomate of the International Congress of Oral Implantologists from Hamburg, Germany in the year 2010, which entitles him for an expert consultant position in implantology. He is the founder of the Implant Center at the University of Sharjah since the year 2011, a former lecturer at the College of Dental Medicine and University of Sharjah and has held positions of Assistant Director of the University of Dental Hospital, Sharjah. Dr. Osman established the first International Specialized Dental Implantology Congress in Dubai, which is known as the Dubai Implantarium in the year 2013, followed by founding Bridges International Company for Educational CME Courses in the year 2015. Dr. Osman obtained his degree of hospital management from the Oxford Institute, UK, in the year 2015. He became an international speaker in the year 2008 and has lectured in extensively in Berlin, Germany, Kotaburu in Malaysia, Ohio, Philadelphia in the USA, and of course in Alexandria and Cairo in Egypt. He is currently keeping a private practice as a specialist oral surgeon and consultant implantologist in Same Day Implant Clinic Dubai and Harley Street Dental Center Abu Dhabi, UAE. Thank you, thank you for joining us, Dr. Osman. It's a pleasure to have you as our dear speaker. Without much further ado, I now request you to begin with your presentation on this bright Sunday morning. Over to you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruben. That's a very uh, uh, extensive and pleasant uh, presentation from your side. Thank you very much. And thank you for everybody who is joining the, this conference. Uh, I'm very glad to be around, and uh, I hope I can say something that can be uh, transformed into practical. Uh, uh, benefit in our clinics. Now, um, um, we're not going to talk about the growth factors because the growth factors are very uh, attractive themselves. But uh, let's start with uh, having uh, uh, um, some memories of our, of our problems in the clinics. Uh, we all do some uh, periodontal surgery or maybe oral surgery procedures, uh, dental implants, of course, flap surgery, even wisdom teeth extraction. And we hope always to have a very, very fast healing. We hope that we don't have any dehiscences in the wound. Uh, we hope that we can manage the difficult cases such as uh, medically compromised patients or even non-compliant patients. So we are trying to get anything from nature or from the patients himself or from whatever herbal treatment, adjuvant therapy, I would call it, uh, to help us achieve this goal. So one of the very interesting topics is the growth factors. The growth factors are derived from the patient himself. And uh, uh, maybe they've been uh, a little bit confusing for us of what exactly is the role of the growth factors. Are they effective or not? Because lots of rumors has, uh, has been there for a very long time, maybe for over than 30 years now. Uh, I've been working with the growth factors since late 90s. And uh, it was uh, applauded very much in the US and it was opposed very much in Germany and some other European countries. And then everybody ac approved it again and then disapproved it again. And then lots of literature said, it's okay for the soft tissue, but not the hard tissue. It's okay for some 
some uh, uh, um, uh, uh, bone formation, but not uh, good for density. So what exactly is the secret and how did it evolve? That's what I, that's what I call it, the, 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 the evolution of this science. Now, before we go to the science, uh, I would go to um, maybe a more important science, which is the biology. What exactly happens in the patient's body? So uh, when we make a flap or when we just make a surgery, any surgery, any noxious stimulus, even if we inhale something that is not uh, uh, healthy, there is something called the regional acceleratory phenomenon that is stimulated in the body. Now, this phenomenon, it, it implies that the body would, draw, would like to um, uh, in, increase the rate of, of repair because this noxious stimulus or stressful stimulus or any uh, injury that happened to any type of cell in the body will have to be repaired very quickly. This, uh, this uh, formula or this uh, phenomena uh, can increase the rate from two to 10 times. But when is it two and when is it five and when is it 10? So we don't know. It depends actually on the, the, uh, the amount of the stimulus itself. And, and it depends also on the biology or the physiology or the health of the patient. <clears throat> this, is, this is done in the body by, by releasing, the body usually releases something called the growth factors, which help the body or which help the cells uh, uh, mature and grow faster uh, at a faster rate than the normal rate. And this happens immediately after the injury. Any type of injury, even if it's a prick of a needle, will stimulate a small bleeding. Now this bleeding will, will, uh, will cause the platelets to aggregate. And the, once the platelets touch a, a, a relatively rough surface, they will degranulate and they will release those growth factors. The, inside the platelets, we have something called the alpha granules. Uh, those alpha granules, they have a lot of uh, growth factors. So those growth, growth factors may, main function is to uh, promote cellular growth and healing. <clears throat> Sometimes they refer to the growth factors as cytokines, although cytokines are a little bit different, but we can accept to call them cytokines because they work almost sim similarly. It's a hormone-like uh, uh, action. And the good thing is that they are present everywhere. If we're talking about, or let's say focusing today about the implant dentistry, so we're focusing about the gum tissue and the bone. So luckily, the, the growth factors are also available in the bone and they are available in many areas in the, in the body, and they are actually specialized. So we have the neural uh, growth factors, we have the transforming growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, keratinocyte, and what's good for us as dentists is that we are employing the so-called PDGF, the platelet-derived growth factors. Why is it good? Because it is multitask. It has a multitask. It is, let's say, pluripotential. So for example, the, the vascular endothelial grow, uh, growth factors, they promote the, the, the newly formed uh, blood vessels. Uh, the epithelial will also focus on the epi epidermal uh, growth factors. Uh, however, uh, the PDGF can, can generate all types of cells. Now, for, to go back to the basics, for any, any type of wound healing, for example, an extraction socket, we will have uh, three components that are very important. For, for the, the extraction socket to heal, we have to have the socket filled in with blood. The blood, we call it the matrix. And uh, the cells that surround the, 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 the socket are, the, re are, are the, the main component to, to start the healing. But without a signaling molecules, without those very small cytokines, without those very small growth factors, as we call them, uh, these processes can be extremely slow. Uh, actually, they might not happen without those signals. So the signaling molecules are very, very essential. So what exactly is the role of the growth factors? First of all, any injury will, 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 will make the wound or the site a little bit deficient of oxygen. So if we don't have oxygen, how do we get oxygen? We need more blood supply to the area. So we need angioneogenesis. We need new blood vessels to come to the area until we fix the, the normal uh, injured blood vessel. We need more cells to, to start the repair. And that's what we call the mitogenesis. That's what the, the, what, that's what the growth factors are doing. And in case of bone, if, if in, in our situation is the osteotomy site, uh, the growth factors are going to form mitogenesis from the osteoprogenitor cells to, to, pro, to promote uh, osteoblastic activity or osteoblastic production and motility and activity. And of course, they also stimulate the BMP production from the, uh, uh, from the cortical area. 
The good news is that they also not only produce the cells, but they can, can attract the cells to the target site. So that's what we call the chemotaxis. So the growth factor, when it's like, let's say they are, they are connecting with a wireless connection to the, to the cells. So they connect to the mother cell to produce a daughter cell and then ask the daughter cell to come along so that it can pass the, through the, the wound the, the site and it will start the healing. It also is responsible for uh, a non-specific collagen and fibrin formation, which is very important for both the soft tissue and the hard tissue cons uh, consequently. This is how the growth factors go. They stimulate the blood vessels, the existing blood vessels. Those blood vessels start, start what we call the sprouting. Sprouting is that they are branching and rebranching, and they form the so-called uh, um, angiogenesis that is a new blood vessel formed. New blood vessel will bridge the gap, like this picture. They start sprouting and they start, start spreading, and then they supply the area with oxygen. Now, some cells, they can uh, have their function normal uh, uh, without the presence of oxygen. Uh, let's say the osteoclasts, like exactly the classic example of the orthodontic tooth movement. When we compress the blood vessels in the, or the minor capillaries in the periodontium and the lamina dura, the cells are uh, strangulated or the, the, the blood vessels are strangulated and this activates the osteoclastic activity. However, osteoblastic activity would never ever start an action without having uh, enough oxygen and enough blood supply. So if there is no blood supply, we will never gain bone and maybe we would never also gain soft tissue. So the key factor here is to have enough blood supply for any wound to heal. This is the classic um, um, cascade of, of wound healing of the socket. If we added the platelet-rich plasma or the growth factors in general, if this will shorten the time from four weeks into two weeks or two and a half weeks, which is very, very valuable for us because we have seen dry sockets, we have seen infected sockets, we have seen a lot of dehiscences, and this is something that we don't want to have. So um, is it important to have the vascularization? Absolutely, as I was just implying, but who exactly needs this specifically? Now, if we think about the, the uh, I'll just put this screen down. If we think about uh, uh, any type, any type of, of uh, trauma or any type of even chronic inflammation, this inflammation creates something called oxidative stress. The example is in this X-ray that I'm showing you. This granulomatous tissue or chronic periapical abscess or whatever it is, uh, deprives the area from good vascularity as it used to have. Now, when we extract this tooth, it doesn't mean that this site is full of vascularity and it is active to receive an implant. We need first to cure at the site, of course, from the excessive granulation tissue, and then we need to stimulate the bone marrow inside this area to reform uh, um, uh, newly for, uh, new blood vessels. Of course, we know that it is inevitable that healing will occur, but we are talking about the time limit here. Uh, you and I would like to have a very quick and short time and very fast healing before any uh, um, uh, uh, complication happens. We're working in the oral cavity and we cannot guarantee that the patient make a, makes a mistake. Uh, and maybe he can eat or she can eat on the wrong side or the surgery side. So we need to make it as fast as possible. So this is one of the indications wherever there's an excitative stress. Of course, it goes without saying any uh, compromised healing potential of the patient, specifically anemic patients, heavy smokers, non-controlled diabetes mellitus, or even uh, borderline vitamin D because low vitamin D is, is a contraindication for implant surgery. But borderline, I'm talking about more than 30 uh, nanogram, um, uh, nanogram per deciliter. And also when patients, we, when we have patients uh, uh, having a borderline or high blood cholesterol. Now high blood cholesterol slows down the osteogenic signals. So there is no bone healing if the bone is, if the cholesterol is high. We're talking about the bad cholesterol, which is the low density lipoprotein, and we have to put it down. So if I have a patient who's diabetic uh, and a smoker and has a high blood cholesterol, and we manage to fix this, of course, before the surgery, I would definitely rather give him a, um, a helping factor such as the growth factors to boost his body uh, and have a, a quicker healing. <clears throat> 
Now, early vascular invasion is a key factor in bone allograft incorporation. Now, healing of a socket will definitely happen easily because this is the body's own uh, 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 tissues. However, when we introduce a guest like a bone graft, whatever the type of the bone graft is, uh, we are calling the body to bring about more blood vessels outside the confines of the body to start attracting and digesting this bone graft material and then transforming it into a natural active uh, and reactive bone. Uh, we do not, uh, we are not putting the bone graft in, in many times or maybe in 90% of the times we're putting the bone graft to become a reactive and a remodeling tissue. Uh, in only 10% of the cases, we put the bone graft as a, um, as a filler material or maybe for cosmetic reasons or to gain some volume for uh, gummy smiles, for example. <clears throat> Sorry. But uh, if we are putting the, 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 uh, the bone graft and we're expecting that it would become a natural bone, then we certainly have to put in mind that all the bone material and all the, the bone um, uh, uh, volume has to be vascularized. Now, when we look at those kind of defects, such as the, the, the extraction socket, it heals inadvertently. Uh, the the uh, sinus, there's a box or there, there's a cavity inside the, the, the body itself. When we have those kind of defects on like a periodontal defect or even enriched splitting, we call all of those a contained defect. Contained defect means that the signals will normally pass through all the borders and the margins of the wound across the bone graft that we will place in this, in this defect. And uh, it will uh, be definitely be, be bridged and it will definitely heal. That's why if we put uh, bone grafts in those areas, any type of bone graft, whether it's a good quality or a bad quality, it will definitely heal because the body will correct whatever we have done inside because of the signaling that will bridge the, those gaps and it will cross over and it will definitely cause healing. Uh, many, many opponents of, uh, of users of the, the, the growth factors, they say it works in my hands that I don't use the growth factors and it does work. Yes, that's true. And those kind of defects, and we don't need a growth factor. However, if, if you have it, then definitely why not use it in those category of patients that we've talked about. Those kinds of defects also like the uh, distraction osteogenesis or the sandwiching techniques, they're also the same principle as the contained defects. They are contained, so the signals are coming from both ends of the autologous bone or, or, or autogenous bone. So the producer cells and the target cells are connected very closely and uh, they are aligned on the same level, so the signals will reach very easily. Now let's come to the classic bone grafting uh, procedure, which we have learned, of course, before that we should put the implant and then put the bone graft. And then we definitely have to actually overfill, which we used to, uh, to have it like, uh, like a protocol in the books. You need to overfill because we are expecting some bone loss. Um, perhaps understanding the biology now will make us understand that because I never understood why, we sh why should I put more so that I can lose it in a while because that's the nature. That's what we thought the nature is. In fact, those amounts of bone, those amounts of bone uh, uh, that, that has been over contoured, those are the ones which will be lost. The reason why, because we, first of all, we put a barrier membrane. So we have deprived this area from the, the periosteal blood supply. Second, because the blood vessels are going to only migrate until the, the confines of the, of the body itself the confines of the anatomy, like shown in this illustration. They cannot travel a further distance because they're not designed to. So that's why we end up having such picture and we are content and happy that the, our bone graft has succeeded, although I consider it a failure. It's not an aesthetic failure. It's not a failure by the true sense of the meaning, but why did you put more and then you lose it? If you just put what's enough and then you will get it. Uh, you, will, you will keep it as it is. <clears throat> in those examples, we have a lot of uh, accidents sometimes when we overfill, the wound sometimes opens, uh, sometimes we have uh, an issue with, with, um, with, uh, with a slow healing, sometimes we open after four to six months and then we find that this blood, uh, this uh, bone graft is not vascularized yet, it's not bleeding, and so it's not ready to, play, to, to, to receive an implant. 
then we have to have to 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 have a guaranteeing factor, or let's say a, a, a helping factor that can guarantee the angiogenesis to form within the tissues of the bone graft that we have placed. <clears throat> this is what they call, the scientists have called tissue engineering in situ, the aid of the signaling molecules or the, uh, on brief, the, the growth factors. Now, is there, can, can a graft come back to life? The graft is dead. Uh, and there is no uh, osteoinductive material except the, only the cortical uh, uh, allografts, any other material, whatever it is, even any type of uh, cancellous uh, allograft is not, is not an osteoinductive. Inductive means that it is active. It can send signals. Uh, so yes, if we put a TCP, for example, uh, it can come back to life, but only when we entice it, only when we stimulate it. If you stimulate the, the life, then the, 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 the blood vessels from the receiver cells, from the producer cells, will bring about more blood vessels to the area. Knowing that we have to have a very quick wound closure, correct wound closure, closure uh, we have also the correct matrix, so the correct uh, bone graft type uh, to, to be, to be uh, placed in the, in the site. And of course, we have to have a continuous supply, and this is a key word, a continuous supply of enticing, enticing molecules or the growth factors has to be active for a very long time. This is a better dog. This is my dog. The other one is uh, a little bit bad one. So uh, let's look at those cases and see if we uh, really can handle the vertical bone augmentation or large defects. Most of the complications that we're facing in the, in the vertical augmentation, not only that the bone graft volume is decreasing, but also during the healing, the soft tissue uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a challenge. Many times it, it dehis because of the maybe wrong suturing, because the volume is too much, because there is no elasticity and the tissue, lots of reasons. And that's why we are always uh, looking for uh, any reason to give us a very, very quick healing and a very quick uh, healing. And here we go also, we can, we can use the, the tissue engineering in situ. Now let's go in depth to the growth factors. How did it evolve? In, in the year 1952, the first growth factor that was been discovered was the nerve growth factor. The nerve growth factor was used to be employed to, to regenerate the nerves of the, of the implanted limbs. In the 70s, uh, a lot of hormone-like materials were, were found in the patient's blood, uh, and they were found that they promote uh, the endothelial uh, uh, growth, uh, uh, epidermal growth, and geniogenesis, and they were not very fully understood. And then until they were understood as a separate proteins uh, that, that, that do have a special uh, property and their own physiology. So we call them the growth factors. In the year 19, in the, in, let's say in the 90s and, 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 the, and the 80s of this, uh, of this uh, century, uh, we, we found out that the platelet-derived growth factor is very effective in regenerating most types of cells, including the neural cells, including the epidermal cells, and all types of cells. In the late, in the late 90, uh, 80s, uh, uh, dental uses of PRP or platelet-rich plasma, platelet-rich plasma that is full of growth factors, uh, has been extensively uh, explored and actually uh, have been extensively found to be very useful. And uh, they were used as the, in the form of a plasma and in the form of a gel. And I will talk about it uh, in brief later. And the year 2001 was the second generation of the platelet-rich plasma. It was called the platelet-rich fibrin. They incorporated fibrin threads into the plasma so that uh, we can have more benefits. And we will talk about it also in brief in, uh, in details in, in a while. <clears throat> now, in 2007, um, uh, the FDA has approved the use of the recombinant bone morphogenetic proteins. Bone morphogenic proteins are very useful in enticing the, the, the osteoblasts, but its use was restricted before. And then only until, until uh, 2007, it has been approved and was found to be very useful in uh, producing more bone. The recombinant growth factors or the recombinant bone morphogenic proteins that is uh, uh, synthesized in in the, in the lab, not taken from the patient's blood itself, were also approved in 2013, and they were found to, to, to be extremely effective to, uh, 
to, to, to solve the problems with, with the vertical bone augmentation or with large defects such as uh, cleft lips or uh, cleft uh, uh, palates or, uh, or um, uh, a big, big uh, loss of the maxillary tissues in, the, in accidents. So we are reliant also on the recombinant bone morphogenetic proteins. Now, recently we have found the more we know about the biology of the growth factors, the more we understand exactly how, do, how those growth factors behave. And we found out that <clears throat> if we have a, a, a lifespan of a platelet that ranges from two to nine days, we say an average of seven days, uh, when we withdraw a random sample, let's say this, the, the blood that we withdraw from the patient to form the platelet-rich plasma or platelet-rich fibrin, uh, we are actually having a mixture of newly born platelets and very aged platelets and young and healthy platelets. So which doesn't mean that all this volume is going to give me a, a, an effective growth factor. An aged uh, platelet will have an aged growth factor with a very minor signaling effect. And our goal is to have a very viable signaling effect. This is what the technology is, produ is producing or giving us that we are now trying to purify those growth factors. We're extracting the blood from the patient or we are extracting the platelets from the patient and we are exploring the viable, uh, um, uh, 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 the viable growth factors and we are growing them in the lab so that we will have only uh, uh, viable and, and, and concentrated uh, uh, growth factors. This is where we are, we are coming up with the, um, the, the recombinant growth factors that I will talk about also later. Now the dental stem cells and uh, do we use them in tissue regeneration? Oh, absolutely, but it is the, 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 the studies are still ongoing uh, to give us a definitive uh, and actual um, uh, decisive uh, evidence to start working with it clinically. Now, if we look at this example, the brain versus the computer, if I'm making a mathematical mathematical equation, uh, I would definitely use my brain and it will work 100%. However, if I use the calculator, it would be faster. So uh, I'm one of the people who were very resistant to use a recombinant, to use an ampoule and inject the patient because I have the, pl the plasma of the patient is doing me a very good favor and it's doing a very good job until we, I saw lots of evidences uh, that has proven that this is a very safe material and it is actually very effective. It is actually more effective. And I advise anybody who's watching me to start searching in the local area, whether in India or the Middle East or in the US or wherever, to start looking for the recombinant growth factors and start using them. In the past, they were extremely expensive, but now they're very cheap, maybe $100, which is nothing per ampoule. Uh, and this is, this is a very good thing and it's a good help for our patients. Now, the father of the growth factors was, uh, uh, according to my understanding in the, in the early 80s, was Professor Robert Marx. He said that the platelet-derived growth factors are very important and the platelet-derived growth factors are uh, extremely useful in increasing the bone density and increasing the, the, the soft tissue quality as well. If we concentrate the, 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 the platelets in the plasma, uh, we will end up having 90% of, the, of, the, of each millimeter, milliliter uh, uh, having uh, viable platelets, uh, but as we just mentioned before, we will have uh, a mixed of, uh, of uh, we didn't know that before, that we have a mixed aged and young platelets, <clears throat> and we will have also 1% of the white blood cells, which is good to add an immunity and uh, prevent the infection of the sites. Now, what is important to understand when we're talking about implant dentistry, if we put the implant that is loose inside the osteotomy site. What will happen? We know that fibrous tissue is going to, to impose in this area and not osteoge oste uh, osteoblastic activity. There will not be any osteointegration. Why is that? Because the osteoblasts are very lazy and they actually cannot travel a longer distance than 0.4 millimeter. And uh, of course, we're not putting a, a, a big defect um, greater than 0.4 millimeter, however, Point four has a condition. I cannot travel as an osteoblast. I cannot travel this distance without giving me a matrix. This matrix has to be some kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, gelatinous material or fibrous tissue or any kind of, of solid material, semi-solid 
so that the osteoblasts, because they move, they are non-motile by nature. So they cannot move in plasma. They have to have to stick their, their pseudopodia to a certain body, and then they start moving, and then they start laying down the, the osteoid material. So which means that we have to, to have some kind of, of a matrix to help them. Also, the blood vessels cannot travel a longer distance. That's why we, we could, could not see the excessive or the over contouring of the bone grafts healing because the, the blood vessels cannot uh, pass uh, beyond the contour of the body unless we entice them. Now, if we look at the growth factors and the platelet rich plasma, plasma means fluid. So we, are, we used to use this as a fluid and uh, uh, it was uh, extremely effective because we can inject it to any site. We can inject it and mix the, the bone graft with the plasma, uh, which enriches this bone graft with the growth factors. However, um, uh, it does not transform this match, this bone into a putty material. So still the, 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 the usability of this bone graft with the plasma was not as easy as we have learned from, from using the so-called the platelet rich fibrin. So one of the advantages of the platelet rich plasma, first that we can inject it anywhere. That's why the, it's extensive. It has an extensive use in dermatology until now. They are using the PRP and not the PRF. They are using the, they're, they're injecting it, especially in wound injuries or in non-healing non ulcers. In many defects, we can actually inject it when we, if we're doing a closed um, uh, uh, periodontal curettage, we can just inject the, 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 the PRP without opening a flap. Or we can also use it with if we're opening a flap and we can inject it uh, after third molar extraction and in many, many other applications in dentistry. It has a widespread applications. However, uh, it is not sometimes very favorable when we are using it with a bone, with bone. specifically if we're opening, uh, if we're lifting a sinus from an external approach and we have a tear in the sinus. If we have a tear in the sinus, I advise anyone not to put the, put the bone graft, just abort the mission or use the other modalities that I will describe now. Now, if we compare the platelet-rich plasma of how is it prepared com compared to the other types, um, in this, in this technique, we are using <clears throat> an anticoagulant and the tubes that we are taking from the, uh, that we are filling with blood. So uh, this anticoagulant will prevent the blood from clotting so that it will, we, it will give us enough time for the centrifuge uh, or the centrifugation uh, so that we can have uh, the, the red, red cell component uh, precipitated down and we end up having a nice plasma on top, but this plasma Still, we, we, we re-centrifuge it for another round. So actually the PRP has two centrifugation cycles. We take this plasma and then we centrifuge it on a faster speed and uh, for a longer time so that we can segregate the pure plasma, the water, which we call the PPP, the, the platelet pore plasma. And then we discard this part and we uh, um, uh, only focus on the middle part, which has something called the Buffy coat, which has uh, a, a very high concentration of uh, platelet, uh, uh, platelet concentration. <clears throat> now, the plasma uh, preparation uh, will, will also in, uh, require uh, the addition of either calcium chloride or uh, with the addition of uh, a thrombin to the, to the component. Now, or actually we use both sometimes. Now, if I take the blood that has, uh, has, uh, that has been mixed with an anticoagulant, it will never clot. So yes, my focus is to get some plasma uh, with platelets and the platelets will give me some growth factors. That's true. But for the growth, for the platelets to be activated, it has to have the, the, any of the intrinsic or extrinsic cascades or the, let's say the thrombin component to start activating those uh, surfaces of the platelets. The platelet surface will be activated in the presence of thrombin, and this thrombin will cause the degranulation of the platelets and the release of the growth factors. So uh, in this technique, or in the previous technique, we used to borrow uh, a, a bovine thrombin, which comes in the form of a powder or a liquid. We mix it with a, with a, with a final uh, amount of plasma, and then we can put all, also one or two milliliters of calcium chloride, which gives us um, uh, uh, a jelly, uh, uh, 
um, uh, appearance or consistency. I'll give an example here of one of my patients whom I, I treated in 2004. Uh, she was a very, very uncompliant patient. She's a diabetic and she's, a, she's like more or less suicidal. She's very young, but a uh, heavy smoker. She smokes shisha. She, she smoked immediately right after the surgery when we put the implant and we put uh, a bone graft and she came to me with a big dehiscence and I had to remove everything. We had to wait and then we put another implant. And that was the second time after the implant has also integrated she also uh, uh, smoked again, and she didn't. She not, she never uh, cares about her diabetes. I was not strict at that time of taking the blood tests of the patient because I used to take their word, and uh, maybe she she was not controlled. And this is the second time surgery that we have done to her, and you can see how scars are uh, awful and the soft tissue. And she said, "I'm sorry, I made a mistake, and this is." uh what what ended up so what can you do doctor i told her i don't know i will try so let me see so we we started uh taking some plasma from the patient uh cleaning the implant surface that's a very important note forget about the titanium brush or the laser or whatever laser can sterilize it antibiotic can also kill the bacteria but this is not enough you have to have your carbide burr and cut all the surface of the implant very, very carefully so that we won't decrease the volume of the titanium itself. So the implant will not be weakened, but you have to remove all this layer because there's a smear layer. Even if, if we put citrus acid, citric acid or any kind of acid, that's also not enough. You have to remove and get a fresh titanium. And the challenge was to obtain a soft tissue quality. So we had to take, uh, we need actually connective tissue graft together with a free gingival graft or keratinized mucosa. So here we couldn't put both because we don't have an underlying bed. So we took a composite graft, we call it a composite graft, which has a component of um, uh, keratinization together with a big uh, amount of connective tissue to be dispersed uh, in a wider surface area and get give us more blood supply. It's all about that this patient doesn't have enough blood supply. Now we know that the uncontrolled diabetes mellitus will give us will give the patient uh, microangiopathy, so disease of the small blood vessels. They actually close sometimes completely. Smoking shisha is worse than smoking cigarettes. Uh, uh, Non-compliance to any post-operative hygiene, or as you can see, her teeth uh, will also make the problem worse with the bacteria. So we have to have the maximum bed of blood supply to give us uh, a predictable outcome. And of course, we have to have an adjuvant therapy or what we call the growth factors. Now, this is the flap in place. Uh, this is the keratinized tissue, as you can see. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a pointer here. I cannot, I don't know how to use the pointer. And then we had to close it very, very, uh, very difficult, very challenging. It was challenging and, uh, and we had to do some um, uh, phrenectomy as well. Then we put the graft. We managed to get some uh, uh, some autogenous chips from from the from the surrounding area with a back cutting chisel. Uh, put some autogenous chips. That's the first layer uh, in con in contact with the implant. And then we put any other type of uh, bone graft, preferably allograft. By the way, allograft, we use it here, not because it is an osteoinductive material. Allograft is not an osteoinductive material, as I said, mentioned before, except the cortical, the purely cortical, which we don't use. We usually use the mixed cortical, cortical cancellous or cancellous bone. The cancellous bone has a big advantage is that it has a very perfect topography for the growing osteoblasts to, to, to give us the maximum wetting or the maximum surface area. So the, the natural osteoblast would like to sit on a natural marrow that has the same topography. The, the, the pseudopodia would like to sit and wet the whole area. So we are maximizing the bone to implant contact. So that's the only advantage. The other advantage, of course, is the mineral content, although we sometimes use it demineralized. But it's all about the topography. And you can see that other companies are racing of we are making a, a, a TCP that looks like the marrow. So it's all about duplicating the topography. So using the allograft here um, doesn't mean that it's going to uh, entice the bone or entice the, the, the growth factors. But we are injecting this bone with some growth factors. 
So after making a thousand suture, as you can see, uh, the, 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 the wound looks very nasty, but we couldn't help but cut it, cutting all the fibrous tissues around the, uh, the scarred uh, tissue, and then injecting the whole site with the platelet rich plasma. This is the result, and you can see it's, it's a very nice result. Actually, I'm very happy with, the, with, with what I saw from the patient. And, uh, and uh, actually she started to stop smoking and she started to be more or less compliant. Lots of studies describe that the, the efficacy of the PRP in soft tissue and in hard tissue as well. Now let's summarize the advantages of this uh, soft tissue and hard uh, uh, platelet rich plasma. It is safe, easy, uh, economic, it's applicable as an injectable material, so we can use it everywhere. But the disadvantage is that it is not stable. If I want to put it in an extraction socket, it might dissolve because it's not sticky enough. Uh, it has a very, very proven efficacy on the soft tissue, but not perfect on the bone. It does affect the bone, but not perfect. The effect fades away in seven days, and it's not really easy to extract blood. Sometimes it's not really easy to extract blood from the patient. And with the regulations we are having here in, the, in Abu Dhabi, that we have to have a registered nurse, not only a dental assistant to, to withdraw the blood. So sometimes this is an obstacle. It's not a disadvantage that you can see in the books, but we can see in real life that um, preparing a surgery with uh, where we are going to employ a PRP, and then sudden out of uh, nowhere we cannot find uh, vessels to the patient so we have to postpone the surgery so that's a, a disadvantage that sometimes I consider. An added value to the uh, platelet rich plasma is just by adding some calcium chloride which makes the, 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 the plasma more viscous so you can use it as a, a when you mix it with the, with the bone it becomes more putty so it gives us an added value and it's the same technique exactly. This has been developed by Dr. Eduardo Anitua. He's a big name in, in Spain, and he's, uh, he's doing a great research on this. You can Google him. Now, this is one of my work when I was doing the master's in 1998 in Alexandria. I used to uh, think, okay, let me just uh, test if the platelet gel is going to have a matrix enough for the osteoblast to travel those distances uh, around the immediate implant. For example, if I extract the, uh, this tooth, I will end up having some more than two millimeters in certain areas, uh, which is recommended to, to put a bone graft in this area because we know that the osteoblasts are not going to be able to travel. But if we put the platelet gel, this is the platelet gel. The platelet gel here looks like a blood clot. It's exactly a blood clot, but it's rich in, in platelets. You can inject it in the site. Uh, put the implant and then put another layer and then close the wound. And this is how the x-ray looks like. And uh, actually it did work like magic, very quick healing. And uh, of course, um, uh, very um, predictable um, uh, um, osteo osteoblastic uh, traveling. Now, what is the difference between the PRP and the PR, uh, the platelet gel? It's only about the fiber network. So in the gel, we are putting a thrombin component from the patient's own uh, component to maximize the amount of fibrin. It was found out that osteoblasts, they prefer to travel like, like climbing a rope. Uh, they are climbing the fibrin threads. So the more we have uh, fibrin network, the better uh, 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 density of the bone going to be. And this is where the second, uh, the second generation started. Uh, which is the platelet-rich fibrin, where we found that the, if we increase the amount of fibrin, we will end up having better bone. Now let's summarize the, the comparison between the plasma and the gel. Um, they're both almost the same, except that the, the advantages of the, the gel uh, uh, is that it has the ability to, to, uh, to, to, to be used in larger bony defects without bone, bone grafting. And it also has an efficacy on the bone density because we have, as we said, uh, amount of fibrin threads that allows a bigger, gener bigger population of osteoblasts to, to be available in the site. And so they lay down the osteoid material. And so we have a denser bone. <clears throat> now the platelet rich fibrin was developed by Dr. Joseph Shukran. Uh, and he said that if we increase the fibrin network, we will have a stronger bone. How can we increase the fiber network? Simply just abort uh, using an anticoagulant. Let's take the, the blood 
from the patient in a clear tube and just centrifuge, centrifuge it immediately. So we were actually ending up having a fibrin clot. Actually, it's a blood clot and it's only deprived from the red cell component and the white cell component and the uh, wasted plasma. And we will end up having uh, platelets concentrated in, in a matrix of fibrin. We call it the fibrin clot. A lot of um, evidences has, has said that uh, this, this material, which has more fibrin, is very essential to, to form bone. Now, we, let's agree that the platelet plasma, platelet gel, and the platelet fibrin, they all have, a, have the same effect on the soft tissue. Now, the soft tissue requires growth factors that will send signals to release more collagen, and the collagen is very essential for the, the development of the growth factors and, of course, the angiogenesis. But to form better bone, we have a lot, we have to have a strong uh, fibrin mesh, mesh work or network. Now, it was found out also that uh, uh, one of the disadvantages of the PRP is that the effect, because the, the platelets tend to die in seven days, that it is, uh, it is uh, more or less, uh, um, it, it is very important to cause the sprouting as we, as we described before. And it was, it was a very astonishing fact or some studies that I've read that when we withdraw the stimulus of the growth factors, that is after the seventh day, those newly formed blood capillaries, if they were not engaged in another capillaries on the other side, they can regress they can fade away, which, is a, which was a very bad news because we thought if we have new, newly formed blood vessels, they will incorporate into the wound and this is good enough. But yes, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't because the, maybe if the wound size, uh, the, the, the gap was bigger, those uh, blood vessels coming from both ends will not anastomose, then they can regress. This is one of the advantages uh, that, that the development of um, uh, growth factors in the fibrin network, uh, fibrin meshwork or the PRF has uh, claimed to be better at. Um, why is that? Because it's the same platelets and it was not uh, convincing scientifically. However, uh, the, the, the way and the, the way of centrifugation will extend, uh, will, will concentrate the amounts of platelets more in the, in the, in the fibrin thread. The fibrin meshwork will harbor more, more growth factors and uh, actually maybe the heavy growth factors they will slightly go down uh, the heavy i mean the, the aged growth factors they tend to be heavier and they go down so we end up having more uh, 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 yeah, effective platelets which has a relatively sustained release of growth factors now we have something uh, 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 called uh, advanced PRF and IPRF, which is the injectable PRF. Those are all developments of the, the, the PRF. Now, what is the advance? Advance is that how about we incorporate also, since we now we understand that the centrifuge speed and even the degree of angulation of the, of the machine itself uh, allows certain types of cells to, to be harbored in the middle layer of the, of the fibrin network and the other heavier components will precipitate down. So after knowing the, the molecular weight of the leukocytes, we said that let's try to, to, um, to, to harbor some more leukocytes in the site and in the, the fibrin meshwork. And then we will end up having a, a fibrin clot that has a lot of growth factors, a lot of um, platelets and a lot of leukocytes, which will prevent the site from infection. <clears throat> So the advanced uh, PRF is, an, is a PRF uh, with some kind of leukocytes. The injectable PRF is only a fluid platelet-rich fibrin. How can it become fluid? Simply because we know the fact that the blood clots from two to 10 minutes or from two to eight minutes, let's say two to 10 minutes. If we put the, the, the machine on a centrifuge very low, at a very low speed for only two minutes, maximum three minutes, and then you open before the clotting cascade takes place. And then we withdraw this amount of plasma, which is full of platelets and it's full of uh, fibrin as well. And then you inject it with the bone or you mix it with the bone graft particle. Uh, you will end up having clotting simultaneously 
uh, uh, while ha ha um, harboring all the bone particulate uh, amounts or the bone particles together. So we end up having something called the sticky bone. So the bone becomes held together, it forms a putty, and it's, it has a lot of sticky properties because of the uh, tremendous amount of uh, blunt, uh, uh, platelets. Now, uh, one, uh, another fact that I really would like to, you know, changing the paradigms of, uh, of lots of dentists, do not use a, a, a barrier membrane. It's called a barrier membrane. So why do you cut off the blood supply that comes from the periosteum? Lots of studies now, they said that there is no difference or actually it is better not to use the, the, the barrier membrane because you are depriving the blood coming from the periosteum to the bone graft. Now, of course, I'm not talking about if you cut the periosteum or you have you shredded the periosteum by accident or you have to cut score the periosteum to, to, to pull the, the flap. That's a different story. We have to put a barrier membrane to prevent the connective tissue. But if you, if you have a, a, a sound periosteum, just put it uh, on top of the bone immediately and do not put any uh, membrane. If you would like to put a membrane uh, because you cut the periosteum, it's better to use the so-called the PRF membrane. The PRF will give us the, the, the prevention from the connective tissue invasion. Plus it will also activate the, the periosteal blood vessels to grow faster and uh, incorporate into the, the grafted material. And of course, it will also entice the recipient side to bring us more blood vessels. This is a purely autogenous bone harvested from the patient's own drilling site. Col collect every uh, amount of bone that comes in the drills. Consider, I consider, I tell my, my nurse, this is diamond. If you lose one gram, then I will kill you. So she, she, she harvests every um, gram from, of, 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 uh, of uh, bone graft uh, from, the, from the, uh, the drills. You can also lower the saline while, while drilling or even stop the saline if you are using a very sharp drill and if you're expert in just cutting quickly and not leaving the drill to go inside the, uh, longer. Now, this, this picture shows the PRF membrane. Uh, the PRF membrane uh, acts very, works very well, and it, it, it should be a common practice. Actually, if we are talking about the economic uh, status of uh, the patient, I would save the patient some money. And act, even if for us, if I'm thinking about the, the machine is going to cost this much, uh, consider that you are saving the, the the, the, the prices of the membranes. So we are actually compensating for the, for the, for the, for the price in, a, in such a very short time. Now, uh, the, the, one of the studies proved that there is no statistical uh, significance, uh, significant difference between bone volume or histological outcome among the three groups. The three groups were having different types of membranes and there is no uh, 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 absolute uh, uh, difference between the resorbable and the non-absorbable. However, if you use the, non, uh, the no membrane at all, that would be a better option. This was a case of dehiscence also. I cannot have a buccal plate in a cosmetic area, a gummy smile patient. So we had to put uh, some autogenous chips and then we formed the IPRF, the sticky bone, the injectable PRF, put it in place, remove the excess and then put the PRF membranes on top and then look at, look at the CBCT, how the volume is very big. And, uh, and this is the final results. We need to take the patient for the second stage, which is the keratinized uh, mucosa or the free gingival graft uh, harvesting, but she's happy and content with this. And that's, that's, that's okay. This is one of the cases that came to the courses. He, was, he put the implant somewhere else and he came to one of my students. She wanted to try the PRF. This, is what the size, this was the size of the defect. Sorry. This was the size of the defect. And uh, we had to clean the implant surfaces. Of course, we removed one of the implants which were extremely defective in angulation. This is the sticky bone, sticky bone in place and we're putting the PRF and this is the result. This will give us a vertical augmentation more predictably because the bone putty is predictable and, and the particulate, if you, even if you put the uh, tension on the graft itself or in the flap, I mean, uh, uh, it will not disperse. It will continue keeping its volume. So one of the added values here with the PRF or the sticky bone usage is that you are keeping the volume of the uh, sticky bone. This is one of the cases which has 
lots of bone. He doesn't need bone. Actually, if we put any kind of bone in this area, it would work. But with a, the, with a grinder like this, uh, I would rather not uh, compromise one millimeter bone. Uh, I'm just having one millimeter bo of bone on the buckle side. I'd rather to have a bigger amount of bone. So we decided to put some sticky bone. This picture is for this patient put the sticky bone and we wanted to guarantee that we will have this width. So we use this uh, titanium uh, mesh and then uh, we put also some further, another layer of uh, collagen membranes for the soft tissue. And this is how marvelous is the result. It's amazing actually, it is really significant. But one thing I want you to notice that, look at the picture here, uh, the bone is formed and it's vertically amazing, horizontally also amazing but the density is not amazing. Maybe it will become more dense after remodeling, that's true. But when we understood more about the recombinant growth factors, we knew that we can increase the density simultaneously during the osseointegration of the, of the healing. That's what I'm going to talk about in, in the new generation. Now let's summarize the advantage and disadvantage of the uh, platelet-rich fibrin. Now advantages, of course, number one, fibrin network is essential for the osteoblastic activity. So we have better bone easier to use as, as, a, as a block. Uh, it's, it's more suited for vertical augmentation. It is rich in leukocytes, which is very important. It gives us less uh, chances of, of infection. It also eliminates the need for the collagen membrane because we are using the membrane because you will use both on the same, uh, at the same time. The same tube, by the way, that we have stopped the, the, the we can withdraw six uh, tubes, eight tubes from the patient and take one or two to, to, to withdraw the, the injectable part and then continue the cycle with the other tubes. So you will have a sticky bone and membrane at the same uh, centrifuge. And it has more growth factors, which has more sustained release. Uh, this advantages is that it's a little bit, little bit relatively technique sensitive because we have to adjust the time exactly. You cannot miss one minute. That's why we are using some machines which are preset. So you can just uh, press the IPRF or APRF or the normal PRF or even adjust it to the plasma as, as well. Th those machines are much better to use and it's user friendly, especially when you're engaged in surgery and your nurse is doing the job. And it also it requires a specific machine. Of course, that's what we're talking about. But as we said before, this is not actually an obstacle. Now, the last component is the recombinant growth factors. If we talk about growth factors, we said that we have growth factors in our own body, but when we withdraw them as a random sample, we are collecting aged and healthy platelets. But if we con construct them or, or, or synthesize them in the lab, or let's say I take them from one patient and grow them in petri dishes or whatever medium, we can have a highly purified uh, 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 human derived uh, growth factors. So it is actually a human. It's an it's a it's a it's an allogenic material. It's it is from human uh, another human, and it is uh, only more concentrated, more purified, and it is it has a more potent stimulation uh, stimulatory effect. So which means that if I would use uh, five or six tubes from the PRF, I would use here only one drop, because what this one drop has at least. Uh, uh, 30 to 40 percent, or maybe 50 percent, uh, 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 50 folds. I mean, uh, the effect of the of the normal platelets that we take from the patient. So, is this successful or not? That was what I was skeptical about when I read about it before, and when the um, you know the 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 companies they come into your office and give you this material. Actually, I was looking forward to use this material very long ago, but it was extremely expensive and I wouldn't uh, use it because I'm happy with the PRP and the PRF. However, now it has, uh, it has a better prognosis, more extensive research. We invited also some doctor from uh, the US. Uh, he's a Japanese doctor living in the US. He's expert in the field, Dr. Han. I invited him to Dubai last December and he gave us a very nice presentation actually. And uh, we started using it since then. So uh, uh, actually, uh, what made me feel very comfortable upon my research is that this man, which is, who is uh, Robert Marx, who is the pioneer in the PRP, uh, he was actually 
completely against the, the, the recombinant uh, growth factors and the recombinant BMPs and the recomb anything that is synthetic. He said, no, I don't need it. I have, I have very good successes in what I'm doing. And it was the PRP and later the PRF. And uh, when he finally, in 2018, published this article, I was extremely relieved that uh, this is a huge, it's a huge study. It's an unsponsored, randomized, open-label clinical trial that is huge uh, amount of uh, uh, sample. And uh, he said that uh, the, re, uh, uh, the, the BMPs, or, or let's say the recombinant growth factors, they regenerate the bone in large vertical uh, uh, ridge augmentation as predictably as 100% as the autogenous graft. So he's not even comparing it with the PRP, he's comparing it with the autogenous. We know that the autogenous is the gold standard because it is by nature uh, 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 chemotactic and it is by nature uh, enhancing and it in entices all the tissues to form. So uh, uh, he, he even added that it also has less morbidity. So if I use the, 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 the tube or let's say the, the ampoule and one drop from the ampoule and save the patient a lot of morbidity, then that would be a very wise decision to make. And uh, that would also uh, spare us non-compliant patients if we use this for that patient that I used to, the non-compliant smoker patient uh, I, I expect that I wouldn't have that much of uh, um, uh, bad results. <clears throat> we can inject a drop on, we can put a drop on the surface of the implant itself uh, and then insert it into the site. Look at the tooth, uh, the site where the tooth number, uh, missing tooth number uh, 46. 46, uh, I extracted it many years back, maybe two or three years back. And it was, there was a huge cyst underneath. We put uh, a bios or let's say a bovine bone because the patient said, I will not, I, I don't use the, the, the bovine bone. I don't recommend you to put a bovine bone for any site uh, preservation or any socket preservation because bovine bone stays in place for many years, not only for many months. So when you read drill, you will end up having some dead bone. It's only an aseptic foreign body. It's a filler material, but it did not remodel. It did not, it was not digested by the body. And those uh, large defects, we can use the beta tricalcium phosphate, which is the best to be replaced very quickly, or the small sized uh, marrow allograft. That would be also a very good uh, component. But the patient was not enthusiastic. He said, I'm, I'm not gonna do any surgery again. Uh, uh, so, uh, and the, the, the defect was huge, actually. I didn't have enough B BTCP, so I added a lot of uh, bovine bone. And then he made up his mind after two years and he said, uh, can I put the implant? So I was very skeptical to put an implant in such a non-viable bone, especially that the x-ray did not show me any um, uh, uh, yani encouraging factors. So I decided to put the implant a little bit loose inside uh, that is, I'm removing more of the osteotomy site and put a little bit of the, uh, the recombinant growth factors, which uh, is claimed to be very effective in, in attracting the blood vessels and uh, very important in forming more bone and very quick as well. By the way, the patient is a smoker. And then we injected another drop on top of the soft tissue. It was a punch technique. This is how it was. And this is uh, on the picture on the left side was the punch. I punched it with a burr actually, because I want to sense the, the, the tissues underneath. And then uh, on the right side is only in 24 hours. Uh, it was a solid granulation tissue. We know that granulation tissue can form in two, three days. And it's usually very fragile, but this one was, was amazing. Actually, it was a surprise for me. That was the first case to use the growth factors with advantages of this growth factors. Number one, uh, uh, I would say it doesn't require any machine. So you're saving yourself some cost and it doesn't require a skilled nurse or a skilled doctor. So it's always in the back of, of my practice. Let's say, for example, uh, uh, the question will be for me, do you use always now the, the recombinant growth factors? The answer is definitely no. I just have to have it in the clinic as a backup. Or as uh, in a case like this, I'd rather use the concentrated purified growth factors in such a defect to give me the maximum effect and the fastest effect better than using the PRP or the PRF. 
In other situations, PRP, uh, the, growth, the recombinant growth factors will not be enough because it will not give me a sticky bone, for example. But what are the advantages that we're looking for? It has the maximum or the fastest healing. The acceleration is, is amazing. Diversity of application, we can apply it everywhere, even in aphthous ulcer. In patients with major aphthous ulcer, just inject it into the ulcer. Of course, we give anesthesia first. Inject a small amount into the ulcer, a small amount like with an insulin um, uh, syringe, you can withdraw 0.3 milliliter, 0.3, and inject it. It's, um, it gives you a, a, an immediate relief, second day, literally the second day. I'm not exaggerating. You can just uh, try it yourself. It's good for soft and, and, uh, and uh, hard tissue, small and big defects. The most important for us as implantologists that it gives me a better density of bone. The, the research of Dr. Han, who came from, I'm not quite sure, it was Columbia University in the US, uh, he focused on the quality of bone. The, like We know that we can form bone with the PRP and the PRF, but with this, we have a better quality of bone. Uh, it also comes as area specific. So the ampoule is for bone, then you can use it only for bone. Uh, actually, uh, nowadays, th there, is a, there is an ampoule for dental use. So dental, it means that it grows bone and uh, periodontium as well, maybe cementum as well, and the, um, the, the soft tissue in this area. But we cannot use the dental to grow hair, for example. Or, or vice versa, the skin uh, products, uh, we can, cannot use it to be uh, in dental use. Uh, I would say it's extremely cost effective and it's of course the purified form. And one of the most important thing is that it has a steady release up to nine weeks, which was a, 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 an astonishing fact that I couldn't uh, uh, know why and how, but it looks like with the, with the tissue engineering technology, we can elongate the life of the, of the platelets or, or the, of the growth factors because they are recombinant growth factors, they are synthesized, and we can give them better life. That's why, or this can be the reason why that the density of bone keeps uh, uh, growing because bone needs about six weeks. And if it continues to, to stay for nine weeks, that would be amazing. As we can see from the diagram here that there's a lot of uh, uh, receptors a new receptors more than the original cell after the mitogenesis because of the effect of the growth factors. So what are the disadvantages? There are two main disadvantages. Number one, if you can say uh, uh, um, relative higher cost than the PRF, maybe, but, but you were not buying a machine. So it's almost the same cost. I would mention the cost in all of those growth factors, even the machines, the complex machines or the tubes. This is nothing compared to the benefits that we are getting and it's within the cost of the, of the procedure. But the actual disadvantage, which was a, a shocking fact for me, is that we cannot use more. So if I can sometimes inject the tissues with a PRP, I can inject the surrounding tissues to increase and encourage the growth factors in the whole region to give me faster regional acceleratory phenomena. Here, it's forbidden, it is contraindicated. Actually, it if you inject more than the recommended dose in the, in, the, uh, in the site, it would give you a feedback inhibition. So if you put more, you can lose everything. So that's why it is very technique sensitive. This is the only disadvantage, and this will be you know, uh, understood with, with time. So when would I require the use of adjuvant therapy? When would I use uh, uh, PRP, PRF, or, or uh, recombinant growth factors. As we agreed, in vertical bone augmentation, if we use the correct suturing, this is another lecture that is very, very important for us to know that the suturing is extremely crucial to, for the success of vertical bone augmentation, even, even for, the, for the horizontal bone augmentation. But if we incorporate, uh, uh, minimize the damages or minimize the risks, by using uh, 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 adjuvant therapy in those cases, that I think that's mandatory. Uh, in cases of peri-implantitis, peri where, where we have loss of bone, of course, some cases of peri-implantitis, we have to extract the whole implant. No joke, no, don't waste your time. And in low quality bone, well, I would definitely go for, um, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, recombinant growth factors. So in the first case, let's say the vertical bone augmentation, I would go for, PRF, the second, also PRF. The third one, the low quality bone, I would go for the recombinant growth factors. The one on the right side, which is the 
the the large uh, large uh, grafts, uh, uh, whether vertical or even bone blocks. Uh, I would go for either PRF or PRP, or the, in the medically compromised patients, it depends also on the case, but we also need to boost their immunity and boost their uh, healing potential by, by giving them some adjuvant therapy. The future is, is to have those growth factors regrow the pulp in dead pulps. Uh, this is an ongoing research. I heard that some Columbia University and somewhere in Japan, they have uh, reach to the decision. It is beyond the scope of what I do. I don't uh, deal with the pulp as much, but uh, I believe very much that it can work. I, I borrowed this from uh, a colleague in uh, British University in Egypt. Uh, she's extremely, she's, um, uh, she's uh, very, very active in doing this research. Dr. Maidi Halmi, she is working with, she's a maxillofacial surgeon in the Department of Maxillofacial Surgery in the BUE. And she showed me uh, yeah, uh, extremely um, uh, astonishing results. Uh, some areas were in 24 hours, it does work. That was that what encouraged me to start working with, with this product. And uh, she used it for the skin, she used it for burns, she used it for a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, grafts, the defects like uh, clefts and many other defects. And the, uh, the, the results were really tremendous. If we summarize, um, what is the advantages and disadvantages? We have two more slides to go. Now, uh, what is? Let's talk, let's compare the three of them: the PRP, the PRF, and the recombinant growth factors. The technique, I think, they're all easy, but the easiest is to withdraw an amp from an ampoule. That is the recombinant growth factors. The healing acceleration, of course, the recombinant growth factors will win. Now, if we if we, uh, I need to change this. Yeah. If we also check the role in the soft tissue, actually they're all the same. There is no uh, better because the, the fibrin that we have in the PRF is not essential for the soft tissue. The soft tissue requires collagen. And as we said, the, the, the growth factors, they encourage collagen formation, collagen type one and type two. So it's good for the, for the soft tissue and for the bone. Okay, so, uh, uh, so uh, the effect on the soft tissue, all of them are good. And that's why even the dermatologists are using the PRP safely and very effectively. The role in the heart tissue, uh, definitely the PRF will win uh, because of the fiber and threads. And we know that this is, this is very important. However, if we want more density, then we would also go for um, uh, the, the growth factors. But why would we go for more density? Yes, if I have an anemic patient, if I have uh, uh, um, a diabetes associated osteopenia, if I have an osteoporotic patient, yes, of course, I would go for the growth factors, not the PRF. But normal patients as an adjuvant therapy in diabetic smoker or whoever, we would go for a PRF. Leukocyte content, of course, the winner is the PRF and the fibrin content as well. Diversity of applications, definitely the sticky bone is, 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 a, is a big plus. Uh, it, is, it is a disadvantage more or less in the growth factors. Uh, for the sustained effect, without saying, the, the, the manufactured in the lab growth factors are way more sustainable and durable up to nine weeks. And regarding the cost, it's almost the same. And as we can see, uh, it's almost, uh, the cost is almost nothing. Technique sensitive. The worst one is the growth factors because uh, we have to adjust exactly the, the dose. And, uh, otherwise, it is more or less like a threat that we might lose the, the material. Now, this is the final slide that I will show you today. Uh, what are the applications? So if we look at the soft tissue, they're all the same. Uh, for small defects, almost all the same. For large defects, we cannot use PRP. We would rather use PRF or perhaps uh, the, the growth factors. In my practice, I use uh, PRF in large defects or vertical augmentation. In sinus membrane repair, what is the sinus membrane repair? We don't go to repair the sinus, but we, are, we go to do an external sinus lifting. And while we are lifting the sinus, we might tear it. If you tear the sinus, you either will abort the mission because we cannot put the particulate bone, or you can fill the site with collagen sponge, 
and you can inject this collagen sponge with growth factors. So small amounts of growth factors, put them underneath the torn uh, uh, sinus. Of course, I disagree with anybody who says you can suture the sinus. This is a, this is a joke. I mean, this is only in, in, in dreams because I don't use microscope and uh, 10 zero sutures. Uh, five zero suture will definitely increase the tearing. So, uh, so let's get real. I, 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 I like to have the real life uh, with everybody who is working like we're all working the same exceptional people uh, maybe I cannot do like them uh, sometimes like uh, like what they are dreaming of so I cut the sinus which has which is very common practice it happens to everybody even if it's a very small tear um, if the patient uh, sneezes by accident and you're putting a bone graft the bone might be scattered into the, the sinus so you don't want to do this so we have to repair it we used to repair it with a collagen membrane but it is not sticky enough. So it's better to repair it with either PRF membrane, which is good because it has a little bit of sticky properties. And what's better is to repair it with some collagen uh, sponge, very high quality collagen sponge that is very dense. Inject the sponge itself with, some, with a drop of growth factors, squeeze it and then repair the, 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 the sinus uh, tear and then fill the rest of the, the membrane, fill the rest of the sinus with the area where you want to lift, fill it with big amounts of uh, uh, PRF. Only the PRF will form bone. Because remember, the industrial, uh, the, 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 the Schneiderian membrane is a double layer. So from one side, it has goblet cells and it secretes mucus. And from the other side, it's actually a, a, an endosteum. So it forms bone on the other side. Once you lift it, it will form bone automatically, even if you put nothing, if you, even if you put only blood. So it will form bone. So what if you put a layer of collagen sponge filled with growth factors and another layer of uh, PRF? This is what I do as a safe measure if I cut the sinus and I see that the patient might or might not be compliant. So that's the safest measure. In desperate measures, we put another layer of uh, sticky bone. So that would be an added value to the uh, PRF. Thank you very much for listening. And you are most welcome to give me your questions. Thank you. I hope that was, it was very clear. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the fantastic presentation and for covering the topic in detail. Dear participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box. You would be covering your questions in the next two minutes. The participants, we would want to know how you felt after attending this presentation. If you felt the present presentation was fantastic, if it was a lovely presentation, if it was a presentation which was an eye-opener or whatever, your comments, please feel free to post. Thank you, friends. Thank you for your lovely comments. We sure the presentation was something that you learned a lot from. Like I mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box. Thank you. I'm, I'm leaving my email address and uh, the phone number as well. If someone would like to send me an email or send me some inquiries or any sources for the references, uh, everybody's most welcome. I've had a passion for this uh, growth factor since late 90s actually. And uh, uh, it is working so far and it is improving. And I'm very glad that the techniques are becoming easier and easier. So for everybody to, to, uh, to get benefit from. Thank you, sir. Friends, please note down the email address as well as the phone number. You can contact 
of speaker, Dr. Emma Dosman, anytime you wish to. You can ask all your doubts as well. We start with the question and answer session. We have a question from Dr. Prabhakaran. Does the implant surface treatment has any correlation to PRF or any other growth factors? Thank you. Does the implant surface treatment has any correlation to PRF? Um, well, uh, the implant surface treatment itself, now we all agree that most of the implants now are SLA and it's derivatives. Like, so it's the SLA uh, uh, treatment that is the sandblasted large grits acid etched. All the implants are like this. Whether it's activated by chloride ions or by, phosph uh, by phosphate ions and like an Astra implant or in Strauman implant or in uh, Neos implants, whatever type, uh, this doesn't really affect the PRF. It just adds an, it, it's an added value. However, now if I have an activated surface like a chloridated uh, SLA active stroman implant, now if you don't use the PRF, this chloride ions will absorb, will help absorption and adsorption of the proteins of the blood, which gives us a, a deeper penetration of the blood. And if you have deeper blood, it means deeper fiber thread and deeper penetration of the, the, the osteoblasts, which increases the, the, the surface area of the implant, uh, the, the, the surface area of the implant, yes? And, and accordingly, it increases the, 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 the bone to implant contact. Now, it has nothing to do with the, with the PRP or the PRF, but if you add an, a PRF, it will be even a better over and above. It's a, it's a more important value than the surface treatment of the implant itself. I mean, the surface treatment uh, value will be this much uh, uh, compared to the, to the value that you added with the PRF. So whether the surface is treated well or not, I mean, if you're using a third grade implant that you're not really confident of the surface treatment and you added growth factors or PRF uh, to the surface and you implanted it, you're increasing the chances that you have better wetting and so better uh, uh, bone to implant contact. I do in encourage you to use the, um, um, the I encourage you to use uh, um, um, FDA approved. Um, no, well, it's not really FDA approved, but let's say good brands because they are uh, keen about creating a topography. Again, about the topography. Topography is the architecture the microarchitecture of the implant, which facilitates the seating of the osteoblasts. The osteoblasts, they cannot be seated anywhere. They will be attached everywhere. But are they attached with the maximum surface area or are they attached only and attached? So you want to maximize the, the, this bone to implant contact. Thank you, sir. The participants, do you have any more questions before we wind up the sessions? If you do, please post them in the Q&A box. Also, I would like to tell you about the next webinar. You can find the link to the next webinar in the chat box. All right, that brings us to the end of the lovely presentation. Once again, on behalf of teamdentistchannel.online, I would like to thank you, Dr. Emma Dosman, for the fantastic presentation, for covering the topic in detail and in length. I'm sure each and every one has loved the presentation. Friends, like Dr. Uh, Osman has mentioned, you can get in touch with him anytime you wish to for all your doubts with regards to this topic. Thank May you, you all have a good day. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.